What's up, gangsters? How about a Spitfire? <laughs> yeah, apparently I am building another Spitfire, I, and I don't. I can't even explain it. I, I don't even understand it myself because I love I love me some variety, but somehow over the last ten years, I've built like five or six of them, and yeah, here we go with another one. I, you know. <laughs> I guess it's kind of understandable since I think that the Spitfire is literally one of the most beautiful things ever created by humans. But the truth is that they're also kind of boring. I mean, it's like if every movie had Margot Robbie in it or Adria Arjona. I, you know, yeah, great, beautiful, but you'd kind of like to have some other things. And the RAF basically said, Oi, mate, you can have any color. Well, wow, I really can't do accents. That's, I don't know if I'm trying to do Australian or British. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I should never try that on camera. But it's like the RAF said, Yeah, you can have any color you want as long as it's green and brown or green and gray. And they didn't really do the whole, you know, nose art thing and squadron colors thing. I mean, look, Mustangs all pretty much look the same coming out of the factory. But, you know, you got a lot of cool shit with squadron colors and nose art. So, yeah, Spitfires are boring and it was difficult for me to find one um, that I was going to really want to do enough to cause me to even be excited enough to do this. Because yes, everybody is all about this Spitfire kit. Kotari, which is the X Wingnut Wings crew, um, I have, I mean, this is, this, is, this is their first new thing. And yeah, it's not new at this point on August 1st, 2024, it's like a couple years old, maybe at least a year old. I got this thing a year ago. Um, so it's old news and I'm not going to really try and wear you guys out with an extensive review. I'm just going to do my usual two part thing where I go through the cockpit and talk about, you know, my feels at that point and then come back and do another one with the, uh, with the finished product. But I've been wanting to build this thing because I have heard so many good things about the kit, it, you know, the way it was engineered, the way it was designed, and everybody says it's just a, a just a wagon load of fun. So I wanted to do it, but I needed a reason to love it. Um, and um, yeah, I finally found that. <laughs> and I should say that, that, that it's been on my mind uh, a lot because... Um, you know, with the Sprue Cutters Union podcast, we did an interview with Richard Alexander, who was the former head of uh, Wingnut Wings, and Darren Mildenhall, who was the designer. And he worked at Wingnut Wings, and he designed this thing. And that was pretty fascinating. So I I've been wanting to do it, but again, I just needed a reason to love it. And I found one. <laughs> so... Um, and I'll explain that more um, here in a few minutes. But with that, let's just get into taking a quick look at some of the parts of the kit and what I've accomplished so far. Okay, so the first thing that I think most of us take out of the box is the instruction book. And, you know, this should be no surprise if you ever built anything from Wingnut Wings. Their instruction books absolutely set, set, absolutely set the gold standard for model kit instructions. They are a work of art unto themselves. Like my normal tradition at the end of a build is to throw away the instruction sheet in the box. Like that's a milestone for me and I'm going to have a hard time doing that because this is just so beautiful. It starts out with a bunch of very informative reading about the Spitfire Mark 1 a mid production written by Mr. Richard Alexander himself. I mean look, if you if you've got any questions about Spitfires, the, Richard can settle it. I don't know that there's anybody who's more of an expert out there, and I was lucky that with what I'm doing here, 
I got some personal guidance from him because I have a little bit of, a, of an acquaintance there. So anyway, what you'll read through here is that uh, this describes the early, mid, and late production, and the kit is designed to be a mid-production Mark 1A. But I wanted it to be, I want for this one to be a late production. In fact, this particular aircraft that I'm doing was part of the last batch of Mark 1A aircraft produced um, in, I believe, 1941 or 1942, maybe. Uh, maybe I may be a year off. Um, uh, oh, okay, it says right here, late production Mark 1A uh, serial number AR2 hashtag hashtag, which is the group I'm building mine from, uh, built at the factory uh, at the Westland factory in Yeovil from July 1941 to January 1942. This particular aircraft probably built in, Jan in uh, July 1941. Anyway, there's a good description right there of what makes a late Mark 1A. And I also just asked Richard straight up to give me some guidance uh, about what I needed to change, eliminate, whatever, and he did. So anyway, just a quick look at this. It's lovely, you get a color chart. You get a sprue map, which is always one of my favorite things. You even get a color picture of the decal sheet. And then we get into the actual instructions, which as you can see, like these guys aren't scared of killing trees, and I love that. The instructions are not crowded. They have lots of cool reference photos with descriptions. You know, you've got a map here for all of the instrument panel decals, and there are many of them. You know, they give you um, views of the assembly, but also what it's supposed to look like when it's done. Um, all of these are, I assume, from CAD renderings. It, it's just great. They, you know, they've got their sort of special little code for, um, you know, what the part number is, the paint color uh, to match the chart, um, you know, the little oval symbol for your decals. And they even show you, like in some of the photographs, where those decals would be. So, I, look, I love it. You're you're just not going to find uh, uh, an instrument. I mean, an instrument, an instruction book that is better than this. Um, it's it's a book in you know in in every sense of the word, and just really truly cool. And a lot of the little touches just really speak to how much Richard loves the Spitfire. He'll straight up tell you, it's his favorite thing. And you can see that level of love just in the production of this book. So here we go with the color schemes um, that they give you. You know, there's a description of what unit they were with and all of the things and none of those matter because ain't doing any of them, of course. No surprise there. Anyway, that's enough of that. Uh, I could gush about that uh, all day. Let's just take a look real quickly at the uh, decal sheet. Um, it's beautifully produced designed by the guys at Cotare, printed in uh, Italy by uh, Cartograph. And these are just wonderful decals. I mean, look at, first of all, like look at how, at how tight the carrier film is around uh, stuff like these, like these letters. I mean, they're it just, it, it's just, it's next level. And, it, and it's kind of hard to see. Maybe, you know, if I angle it just right, you'll be able to see. It, it's really, really good. I mean, there's places where you've got more carrier film, obviously, like right there. But you can trim that away. They really minimize you having to do much of that if you're going to use these. But the carrier film is super thin, and I didn't really have much trouble with it on the decals that I used, which were all down here on the bottom of the sheet that I've already chopped off because they were uh, instrument panel decals, and you can kind of see what's left of that part of it over there. So look, these are, are fantastic. And 
I ain't gonna use any of them, at least not the big ones, not the markings, because I'm gonna be, uh, as usual, painting all of my markings, and the squadron code that I'm gonna be doing is totally different, so, yeah. Uh, but, like, look, they even give you the uh, doped fabric and lacquered patches that were put over the machine gun ports to keep them from uh, freezing up and getting trash in them. And you've got a fired and non-fired version. And even with the, you know, the, the wavy outline to indicate that they were just, you know, pieces of cloth that were taped and, and then hand, hand painted with dope. Uh, I just, yeah, that's the level of love that you see in this kit, and it's fantastic. I'm not going to take you through all the sprues. Um, again, there's plenty of reviews of all of that stuff. Um, but just as one example of the level of detail and the sharpness of the molding, there you go. Look at the wheel, the, the tires, the wheel halves. You can see how crisply molded the details are there. Everything in here is like that. Now I will say, before I get to it, I'm not going to even use those though. As good as they are, I am going to use the 3D printed wheels and tires from Tom Annis that he makes. I've already downloaded the STL files. I just could not pass that up because his designs are so good, and um, yeah, you don't have to deal with the whole fill in the seam uh, part of, uh, of the process. With that said, I am done with the cockpit. Gotta get all the hairs out of there. Um, and it is ready to uh, join the fuselage together, but let's talk about it for a minute first. As you can see, uh, this is what I mean when I talk about the beautifully styled and molded detail. I mean, just super, super crisp. And there's just a lot there. I mean, down to even the rivets on the, uh, on the longitudinal ribs. Uh, even though the uh, uh, even though these air tanks are molded in, you know I'm not mad about it because the important part is really crisp. You get a good surface separation that gives you a good color separation for the clamps. I mean it's just it's just lovely stuff, and you know the throttle quadrant is molded in, but again I'm not mad about it because it just looks so good all of it and that carries on through everything except one place which i'll get into in a in a little bit but let's look at the instrument panel because this is the real masterpiece of molding and hopefully i can get the angle right here where you can see it i mean look that's just gorgeous there's really no reason to use an aftermarket instrument panel on this model. Um, you know, if you're willing to do the work of applying the decals, and they are separate decals. It's not one big instrument panel decal that takes a gallon of Solvacet and an industrial heat gun to make it go down, and even then doesn't fit right. It's not like that. They aren't all, they're not 100% separate decals. Like in that, uh, in that cluster in the middle, uh, that's the uh, IFR cluster, if I recall correctly. Like the top three gauges and the bottom three gauges are two decals that have a little bit of clear film in between them. And you can separate those if you want to, but for the most part, I, I kept them as they were. There were a couple of places where afterwards, like after one application of Mark Fit Strong, I had to come back and cut some of that connecting film um, and then reapply uh, some, some Mark Fit Strong. But for the most part, the decals were just absolutely wonderful everywhere. They came off the sheet really quickly. They responded to Mark Fit Strong beautifully. 
and I, I put them on, I put them straight on the paint as I most often do um, in most cases, but in a lot of cases, I also put them on the, uh, on a layer of uh, flat clear. I actually, uh, I just made a video about uh, what I call the one good reason to gloss before decals. And that comes down to a color shift issue that can happen when you put decals that have clear film around the, the, the artwork directly on lacquer paint and then use a lacquer clear on top of them where the lacquer clear you put on top, which in this case was MRP Super Clear Matte, reacts more strongly with the paint than it does with the clear decal film, and you get what we can really kind of only call a color shift. And you can see it right there around that red text. You can see the clear film. And that was just a mistake on my part, first of all, because... I was in a hurry, I forgot that I had put those decals directly on the paint and just blew clear on top of it. But secondly, because those were actually one decal connected by a big piece of clear film, and I just instinctively chopped the clear film out from between the two sections before I put them on there. If I had left it, you'd never notice that because the difference would be between the ribs rather than between the decals. So anyway, um, that's a that's a video I did just uh, like a, you know a few weeks back, and it goes into depth where I actually test this color shift issue and show how it happens and what you can do to prevent it. Basically, if I'd had a layer of even uh, MRP Super Clear Matte underneath those decals, you would not have seen that color shift, and I can prove that because over here, if you look at the uh, decal on the oxygen tank. It's kind of hard to see uh, in there. Maybe the camera will focus. But all that white stenciled text that's on that, that black oxygen tank, that's a single clear decal. I cut it in half to make it conform better over that clamp. But Lots of clear film there, none of which shows, and that is on that decal was applied after I already had a layer of MRP Super Clear Matte right there. So, because that's just the way it worked out. Sometimes I just kind of get going and I, you know, just kind of go on with the process and shit happens. What can I say? Anyhow, I, I am super pleased with, with the detail, the level of detail. I think this may be the best cockpit ever. I mean, you know, I've seen like like a few others, like the the uh, recent Edward Mustang cockpit is really really good, but it's 148. The Tamiya uh, 132nd scale cockpits are obviously really really good, but you can see in a side by side comparison that the detail here is better. They just their their basic strategy with this kit was to put all the love right here because this is what's going to show and you're going to spend a lot of time on this and you know blow off having an engine which was a whole thing there were you know some haters on the interwebs who were like Kokuma doesn't have an engine bro and you know a lot of us were actually happy that it didn't have an engine because we were hoping for a really like we've we've asked for really high quality 132nd scale kits that put all of the energy where it's like most important to us and you're not forced to deal with open panels and engines and things like you are on the Tamiya 132nd scale stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. It's great. Unless you don't want to do that on your, you know, on your current project. And uh, so this thing, I think half of the parts probably are, are in the cockpit. I mean, from here on out, it's going to be probably a pretty quick uh, build because uh, it's just such a simple kit otherwise. But you can see uh, what, you know, what I mean when I talk about like really high quality on the other stuff. Look at these raised rivets, uh, you know, that detail on the outside of, of the fuselage. So I'm super stoked with the... With the uh, molding and the design of, of the details. Just fantastic. Makes it fun to work on. The other thing that makes it a lot of fun to work on is the engineering. Um, the way that everything goes together and the fit 
is just really good. Like, let me give you an example. Um, you get, you know, stuff that just really makes makes things easier, like the uh, the trim wheel right there, that big one with the ribs on it. That's a separate part, so you can easily get perfect color separation. The um, uh, the the way that these fuselage frames attach is really nice. I, you guys know, if you've ever watched much of my nonsense, I am an evangelist for making it where parts can only go on correctly one way. And that's the case. Look at, look at how the tab, the slot and tab arrangement for all these frames is offset. So you're only gonna put those on there one way if you you know want to get it on there correct. It's details like that that I really love and respect as a as a, an engineer and as a model builder because you know it just takes some of that stress off. I mean, look, if you haven't ever put a part on backwards, if you claim to have never put a part on backwards as a model maker, then I don't trust you because you'll lie about other things too. Anyway, so. Detail, beautiful, molding, beautiful, engineering, beautiful. I love all of it for sure. Um, now, there are a few things, uh, there are a few nits that I, I want to pick, and I'm going to try not to spend too much time. But, you know, one of my review build things would not be a, one of my review build things if I did not discuss stuff that I'm kind of not a fan of. And they're really are four things. So, a simple one is if you look on the back side of this fuselage frame right here, the one that the seat is attached to, you will find right here uh, below this, this little flange right here, but on the opposite side. In other words, in front of that black box looking thing right there. Richard Alexander told me it was called an accumulator. Anyway, whatever it is, between that and this fuselage frame, there is a very small rectangular patch of material. And I noticed it uh, when I was kind of dry fitting it because it rubs up against the front side of this black box and it made this frame tilt forward. And so I asked Richard about it and he said, well, it probably wouldn't make much difference, but it's there to keep some space between the black box thing and the frame, which, yeah, you're not going to see. I think they kind of like overthought that one because it's just really not important. And again, it caused mine to tilt forward. And so I filed it flat and that, that took care of it. Now, I will say... These fuselage frames are where the famously tight wingnut wings, now Kotare tolerances, are going to show up. Uh, you know, they, they, they do build in, they do design in tolerances, but they are tight. And paint will fuck with them. And you guys can see, I don't, I don't paint thick, okay? This is, uh, this is a layer of... Mr. Surfacer 1500 primer, silver, almost over the whole thing, uh, MRP interior, RAF interior gray green, uh, and some probably, you know, two or three layers of MRP super clear matte. And it takes about three layers of, of, of an MRP color to get a solid, um, you know, pigmentation like that. So, you know, there's a half dozen layers of lacquer there, and you can see it has not affected the sharpness of the detail at all, but it will affect the tolerances. You know, you've got on these fuselage frames, uh, you've got, I've got, because I paint everything, like I, like I painted these while they were still on the sprue, because they're just easier to handle that way. So, let's see if I can kill, a, kill one of these flies. What would a summertime video from Rube Goldberg Enterprises be without flies, right? Anyway, I got paint and super clear matte on both sides of these fuselage frames, and then it's also on both sides of whatever makes the slot that they go into, like for example, right here you've got this little uh 
this rib and the frame has to go in between those two things. So you've basically got four thicknesses of whatever paint and clear you've got there and it's enough to make putting these ribs or sorry fuselage frames into these previously mentioned slots a bit tight. You know, a little bit of Tamiya Extra Thin will definitely lubricate things and it'll probably be fine, but I had to use a little bit of pressure. And, you know, some people say, well, you shouldn't be gluing stuff with the paint. Well, look, Tamiya Extra Thin will dissolve pretty much any kind of paint, but especially lacquer. I pretty much almost never worry about getting rid of the paint in, in, in situations like that. The one thing you do have to worry about is if you've got glue, like if you put glue in the slot and there's a lot of it in there and you you stab that 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 tab in there if the glue spooges out and takes paint with it you can create a little bit of a of a mess so you know you just let the glue evaporate for a second until there's not too much of it and you do your business but point being is the tolerances are super tight that's not a bad thing it's just a thing that you need to watch out for if you are going to glue all of this together before you put even one pig grain of pigment of paint on there, you're probably gonna not have any, you probably won't even notice. You'll just think, damn, this thing goes together perfectly because that's how it's tolerance. But it just depends on what your strategy is for how you like to build and paint. I, build, I tend to do as much painting as I can on something like this first because I want to get the perfect color separations between surfaces and I don't wanna have to pick up a paintbrush in order to deal with something like that trim wheel. So yeah, there's risks either way. Anyway, that's a little bit of an aside. So that little that little bit of material there was was one thing that I noticed. Wasn't a huge big deal though. All right, a, uh, the second thing uh, that I wanna talk about is, um, yeah, this is a little bit more of an issue, okay? I'm doing the canopy closed. And so you get two different versions of the door. And, um, you know, you got to, they make you do some stuff to uh, install that. And I'll show you in the instructions. Okay, so right here, if you're gonna do the door closed, you uh, need to remove the edges of the opening in the fuselage. And I, I, I'm not a huge fan of that for two reasons. One, that's something that's just really easy for the average model maker to screw up. I mean, you at a minimum, you need a, a something like one of those Goodman sanding blocks that's got a hard plexiglass block with the sandpaper attached to it so that you've got a flat surface and you can keep that straight once you clip it off of there and you go to finish those edges because you know, that's, that's a panel line. That's the edges of the door once, once the thing is glued back in there. And so you really need for it to be straight. The second reason that I'm not a huge fan is because once you do that, there's really nothing holding this piece in there. And so as you can see, what I did was I had it resting on the bench like this and uh, just kind of held it this way and put a little extra thin in there. And it, of course, because I just wasn't thinking, went right through the gap onto the workbench and created some extra work for me right there that I have to, I have to sand off and deal with probably reinstating some, some rivets there. That's not their fault, that's my fault, that's just me being incompetent, but I, I really wish that there were some features that would hold this thing in place so that you didn't have to do any sort of gyrations. And there's you know different ways to do it. And I get that the, the, the vast majority of, of builders are gonna have the door open. I get that. So they wanna make them happy and not worry too much about the people who are gonna have it closed. But I still feel like that you kind of could have your cake and eat it too. The other thing is that with it in the shut position, 
you got to come back and deal with this little bit of body work right here. Again, not a big deal. That's nothing major. I just, again, I would like to see, you know, what some other options uh, would be for, uh, for doing that. All right. Um, now, here's where the next uh, thing comes in, and that is with the seat belts, okay? And, and I, again, I know that most people are not going to use the molded-in kit seat belts. I chose to because this thing is going to have the canopy closed, and I really just didn't want to put a bunch of time and energy into anything that wasn't going to be important. I mean, even as, as much as I tried to keep this to the minimum standard, I felt like I still ended up doing a shit ton of work just because it was so cool and fun. You could really go down the rabbit hole with this cockpit, and I normally would have used something like HGW cloth seat belts if I was going to have the, the door open and the canopy open, but I'm not. So I, I used the molded in kit seat belts, and the first issue with those is, and you'll see it again here in the instructions, they want you to cut those seat belts at a place that's molded in on the bottom side of them and then glue them back together after you install the seat. And here, this will make more sense. If you look right there, you can see where they want you to chop it in two and then you're going to have that and you're going to put the armor plate there and then when you put the seat onto the frame, then you're just going to have the tip of those chopped off seat belts right there in that little slot and then you'll come back on the next page at the right time and you will glue in the back part of the harness and that's you know there's nothing wrong with that it's it's fine but i instinctively wanted to leave the seat belts all as one piece so i opened up that uh slot right there uh, just enough to do that. You really can't tell. And uh, just counted on being able to insert the end of the belt through there when I added the uh, seat and armor plate subassembly to this uh, bottom portion of the of the cockpit subassembly. It was not glued into the fuselage at that point, but it was still a little sporty. Uh, I mean, it's really beautifully engineered, but the seat frame attaches in four spots to the back to the to the front side of this frame, and the <laughs> the uh, with, with the belt going through that slot and not having much uh, slop. It acted kind of like a spring that wanted to make the seat sort of like pop out and not stay stuck into its four attachment points. And I had to do some creative, like put some padding on, because this is all painted at that point. So I had to put some padding on there and hold it to the frame with my tweezers and reach in there with some, you know, with a little bit of super glue. It was just, it was just like, you know, monkeys and footballs, if you know what I'm saying. But I got it done. No big deal. The thing that I really uh, am not a fan of with the seatbelts, however, is that this is the one place where the molded in detail just really does not measure up to how good it is everywhere else. I feel like if you're going to have something like this, that even if it's a little over scale in terms of thickness, that the detail has to really stick out, like literally has to stick out because you need edges to catch your paint and, and give you the opportunity to have nice color separations on something that's admittedly pretty small and difficult to paint. People who build 148 aircraft and deal with molded in seat belts all the time are like, yeah, whatever, bro, uh, stop whining. But I just feel like that you can do better, okay? This, these are the seat belts for, uh, th these are the seats, these are the 3D printed seats from Arma Hobby for their hurricane. And you can see how crisp and uh, sticky outy all of that detail is, even at 148. And the magnitude is about the same as on on this uh, on the Kotari seat belts, even though they're 50% larger. I just feel like that they they just could be uh, uh, you know they could have made it a little crisp a little more crisp. Now I also get that some of that is about the way 
that this seat part comes out of the tool because what may not be clear is that the uh, seat is in three pieces and you can see that here um, what you're going to do is you're going to select which one you want according to Sorry for the camera swing and hopefully nobody's getting seasick. Anyway, you're gonna select the seat part for the middle, either B7 or B9, according to what you're gonna do with the seat belts. And then you're gonna use the sides uh, either way. And so, you know, it, it's a little bit of a complicated part in the way that it comes out of the tool. And I could understand where some of that detail, they might've had to compromise on some of those sharp edges in order not to have undercuts, but, what I would really hope that they might consider for their next one is this type of thing from Fine Molds. This is really cool. I don't even remember where I got these from, but these are Fine Molds 148th injection molded seat belts for modern jets. And they are, I think they're pretty innovative. They come on the sprue as a flat part, but because it's so thin, you're gonna be able to mash it into shape. Um, you know, I, for sure, you know, if you, if, you, if you glue them in there before paint, um, but you might also be able to, to take them off of the sprue and form them and then paint them and then put them on with super glue just like you would with any other type of aftermarket seat belt. But the point is, now you can have an injection molded part that's just the seat belts and then have a single seat back part and not have to, you know, I don't know if that's really gonna be much cheaper or easier in terms of tooling, but I think it would be more fun as a model maker because I spent way too much time dicking around with these seat belts trying to get them painted satisfactorily and you know just to be happy overall with the thing but that's that's really uh, th that's really it i mean it, it you know it's it's hard to to complain much the only other thing and this is really nitpicking okay this is also another detail thing is these um I think if you look on the left hand side right there by my finger of the instrument panel bulkhead there's that characteristic set of three um, and I think that they're airlines they they are typically uh, either copper or brass and you see it on all Spitfires and they come out of that that hole right there and run down the side of the leg opening in that bulkhead and it's just you know it's one of those things that's just really you know unique to spitfire cockpits that that you know i think most of us have probably added as a detail and i just kind of feel like that this is one of those things where maybe overscale looks a little weird in the design phase but as a model maker you appreciate it because it's so easy to paint and wash and make it stand out as a detail. These are nicely molded, and I'm sure that they're probably to scale, but they look not good uh, painted, and I don't think I did a terrible job painting them. There's just They just don't stick up very far, and there's no space in between them to catch a wash so that you know it's actually three separate uh, Three separate lines I, you know again that's really nitpicking getting down to a level of 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 whining that i know you know a lot of guys are gonna be like dude shut the fuck up now you're just reaching but look you know it's a thing it all depends on what sorts of of you know details you're after and how you like to work anyway the other thing uh, i should point out uh which sharp-eyed observers and spitfire aficionados may already have been wondering about is the fact that the seat is not really correct, okay? Now, I mentioned early on in the video that I was gonna try and convert this to a late Mark 1A from a Mark 1A mid. And I asked Richard to kind of just give me the down low uh, on what needed to be changed in addition to what's written here. 
And the seat is, is one of the main things. When they went to the latest production of the Mark 1A, they were using the uh, composite, the phenolic resin, the Bakelite, whichever of those three names you want to call it, they're all correct, uh, seat that uh, has that characteristic rusty orange color. It's really cool. And it's almost the same shape as the aluminum seat, but there's a sort of a football shaped depression in the bottom of the Bakelite seat that's different. Uh, you can see it's kind of a trough shape that goes all the way across in this one. And, I, you know, technically, actually not even technically, really, I should have, you know, gone to Fusion 360 and made a whole new seat and frame. And if this was going to have an open cockpit, I would have, absolutely. But again, because I'm, you know, going to have this thing with the lid shut, and it's not going to be very visible in there, plus with the molded in seat belts, yep, yeah, I cheated. I did a little fuckery there, and I just painted it the correct color and left the rest alone. But I really do like the idea. Some of you may also be saying, hey man, how come it's not all RAF interior green? Well, the instructions say that these armor plates were probably black, and I've got pictures of even the phenolic seats with a green cushion on them. And, um, and also, somebody even picked up on this when I posted pictures of this uh, to Facebook today. You'll see some different green tones with things like the, the, uh, the radiator louver handle and uh, some of the other gizmos. That there, would, that there probably would have been some variance in those green tones where some of them might have been RAF interior gray green and some of them might have been supermarine green. So I just, you know, nobody's ever going to be able to say that this is wrong because like most early Spitfire cockpit shots, for sure, there were never any photographs. Uh, so, you know, I just did what I wanted to that I thought was plausible and looked cool. The other thing that you may notice that's required to take this from mid to late production is to change from the hand operated landing gear jack to the hydraulic jack. And that part is um, right here, okay? Part B19 that has an X through it, that's the, that's the jack handle. And you gotta eliminate that if you wanna go up to the late production. You also, according to Richard, uh, need to probably eliminate both of those gizmos. And there is a, uh, uh, like a, he said it was a reservoir of some kind that is, uh, where is it? Um, it's, oh, this thing right here, part number B18, you can eliminate that. And then there's a, the, the, uh, the little uh, jacks uh, that are actually in the gear bay right here are also not needed. Uh, and he, you know, according to him, that's all the stuff that you need to eliminate in order to, uh, uh, to bring it up uh, to later production, but there are a couple of things that move, all right, and yeah, that part A55 is the later part, the spare bulbs, and you need to, to don't do like I did and forget to cut that slot and end up having to just glue that uh, thing to the already painted uh, cockpit wall. Uh, but you need to do that. And then um, this uh, thing right here needs to move that part number B17 needs to move up to basically right there about where the arrow points for B13. And I'll show you uh, in the finished thing what that looks like. That's all of this stuff right in there. So, and, and as far as this cord or hose or whatever that is coming off of the bottom of that black round thing that got moved, yeah, I'm not even sure that, that rust is the right color for that. I've seen different things, but 
again, I didn't want to spend too much time in the rabbit hole and um, that's not going to be visible with the canopy closed. Now, the one thing that I really did feel like I have to do, and this is how the stupid gets started, I find a color scheme that I fall in love with and then the next thing I know, it turns out that that's not the version of the kit and I have to go and start doing stuff like manufacturing a new landing gear control. And that's what that big black gizmo down there is with the lever sticking out of it. That's a part that I designed in Fusion 360 and printed on my 3D printer. And I'm really pretty stoked with the way that that came out. I um, pre-print drilled holes in the fittings on the bottom side of it so that I could poke that point, uh, three millimeter uh, brass wire into it to represent the hydraulic lines. And then that, that actually is kind of almost the easy part. There's a, a slot behind that gizmo and uh, I have a tab on the back of the, of the thing itself. And so dropping the part in there, getting it, you know, it actually fit right the first time, which never happens to me. But it dropped right in there um, and then actually installing the, the, the hydraulic lines was relatively easy. The tricky part with Spitfire cockpits is all of the hoses and things that go across a bulkhead like these do because they do they go through that leg hole and you got to deal with them somehow on the back side of that and yeah i just kind of you know did a glob of glue in there because again not going to show but the part that does show i'm uh, i'm pretty stoked with i think it i think it does the job so um i'm glad to have the opportunity to show you guys all of this because yeah um, uh, as soon as I attach the other side of the fuselage, all of this is going to disappear. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> what would one of my sort of build review things be uh, without flies and uh, a lot of uh, exhausting and overly detailed analysis of the kit? But hey, it is what it is. It's been a minute um, since I did one of these, so I guess at least I haven't lost my touch <laughs> such as it is anyway um, this thing has been a lot of fun and um, I you know I feel like that the way you do anything is mostly the way you do everything and so that's part of why I do these build reviews in two parts because I feel like that with an aircraft kit by the time you get through all of that cockpit work that you have a pretty good idea of what a model kit producer's sort of design and engineering philosophy is going to be. And theirs is every bit as lovely as I expected it to be. These guys are, are really good. I, I just, you know, I, I love the way that they think about it. I love the amount of love that they put into it. And I can't wait to see what they do next. Even if it's something that I'm really not that in love with, it's going to be hard not to find a reason to build it. So um, who knows? But at any rate, I hope you found this um, analysis useful and maybe even a little more in-depth than some of the other ones that are out there. But regardless, if you want to build a Mark I Spitfire, this is the thing. Get this. I mean, unless you just have to have 148, because the Tamiya 148 one is, is one of the best model airplane kits in history. Don't even have to have built all of the model airplane kits in history to know that. If you want 132nd, and why wouldn't you? I mean, I'm just saying, you know, size does matter. This is the kit. This thing is fantastic. And uh, yeah, so... Stay tuned for part two, and we'll see what the outside looks like. As always, I appreciate you watching. Much love.